Um, yeah, I'm going to actually talk to you about data, which actually came a little bit into the talk before. But um, I'm going to ask you first this question. You've heard so much about data, but whose data is this really? Um, I think that sometimes, you know, I, this, this data is really ours, but we don't feel like that. When you hear terms like big data, that doesn't feel like, at least for me, it doesn't feel like it includes me. It probably doesn't feel like it includes you, unless you're one of the few exceptions um, who are actually working with it already. A data society, is that really what we feel like we live in? Um, what do people mean when they're actually talking like this? An information society, we've been hearing that in the media for you know, 20, 30 years now. Um, but what's actually really happening is we're developing a new type of elite. This new elite are those people who work with the data, those people who work with big data. Um, so in our information age, instead of actually moving into some new type of society where um, we all kind of feel empowered, we've reverted to the dark ages. You know, when I say to you, we have data barons, you actually know who I mean. And these days, it's actually been in the news all the time. Um, and, you know, even though it's my job to work with data, and I do data visualization, I'm not one of these data barons. I am much more a data surf, where I get to go, you know, to be part of the social enclave and till my little data field for the profit of somebody who isn't me. Um, right? <laughs> it's the way it goes, isn't it? Um, so, but, you know, actually, I think we need to change this. And we need to think about this individually and how it works for us individually. We need to think about what we can actually do as a society to change this. So, first, let's look a little bit at history. Let's go all the way, 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 way back. And, you know, in evolution, they talk about, like, we became humans, who we are as humans, because we're tool makers, because we're tool builders, you know, because we found out figured out how to make tools to actually empower ourselves. But actually, it was not only tools. If you, well, you don't even have to just think about it. The evidence is that we started as much with data as with tools. This is a sketch of the earliest found human artifact, 38,000 BC. It's a long time ago. It's a data viz. They think it's probably a lunar calendar or perhaps a woman keeping track of her menses. That's a long time ago that people have been thinking about tracking data. And yes, it's tool building because somebody needed something to scratch those marks on that bone, but it is also data. Um, so data has been ours as humans, always has been, and uh, yes, we are tool builders, but not only tool builders. We use both tools and data together to make us who we are, to make us inherently who we are as humans. So think about it anecdotally. So you're reading an exciting adventure novel and the protagonist gets trapped and they're imprisoned and there they are stuck in prison and they have no idea how they're going to get out and what are they going to do to try and help preserve their sanity? They're probably going to scratch marks on the wall to keep some record of passing time, to keep some way of some record of when they were free and of reminding themselves about that's what they're trying to do and how long they've been enduring this. And we all nod to ourselves and we think, yeah, that will help keep them sane. So this data, it's like ours. It's inherently ours. We all use it. And I think, you know, 
think about it. Like, all of you, when you were born, your mother kept, you know, a, a, a birth book, a baby book, with all kinds of data about you that she stored very lovingly to, to remind her of what was happening. But also, it's like useful later when you can, you know, phone up your mom and say, did I have this when I was a child? And she'll know, right? Uh, so, you know, also, we've used it in our lives all the time to make decisions. In fact, you know, your mom decided, oh yeah, we have to go to the hospital, the fever is just too high, or this has been going on too long, I need a doctor's advice. She was using data to make decisions. So when people talk to you about big data and make it sound like you can't do this, you have been doing this, we have been doing this. Data and tools together have made us what we are as humans. So we need to take back our ease with data. But it's not actually so easy to do this. You know, the question is how can we do this? How can we turn this around? How can we actually still become involved in this? And uh, yeah, how can we still make this you know, planet inclusive and diverse and welcome everybody and have accessibility and transparency in our data? So yeah, as a group, we started to actually think, well, can we do this? Can we actually think, instead of making visualizations only for big industry and big data, big government, can we make it for individuals? Can we try and actually use data to help move towards an informed society? And um, so we've done a few small steps in museums and in public spaces. This is a little example of uh, an augmentation that was actually down here at the Glenbow. Um, an Emily Carr exhibition came to town, and this was a touch interactive interface to show the context of the rest of her paintings and writings. This next one is an alternate and visual way of search, where perhaps you might want to look for a book by the color of its cover digitally without actually having to go into a bookstore. You can get some of that freedom of saying, you know, what's the book that looks like the one I would like to read? Um, one of the things that we worked with is the Aurora Borealis data. Um, and here we have a public installation where the motion of a person working, walking by kind of informs them that if they go up and interact with it, they will be able to see more. And if she would touch that, it would open up to the night that she chose, and she can choose where the aurora was active and see you know, the aurora in motion. This next one is kind of imagining the situation where, say you want to plan a canoeing trip, and maps are easy to come by, but actually figuring out the length of the river or the length of the rivers in comparison with each other, not so easy to come by. But here you can just trace them with your mouse or with your finger and pull them off and make yourself a little river bar chart. Um, this one is more for like personal amusement. Um, if you are a football, soccer fan and here we have the games between Liverpool and Manchester United. And the gray ones are the draws where nobody won. The bright colors are the wins from each team. So we've done the same thing that we did with the rivers and pull it out and turn it from a pie chart into a bar chart. But now I think maybe I'm just interested in the wins. I don't want the draws as part of my data visualization that I want to talk about. So I can just make my own personalized one. But this is interactively personalizable. So maybe I just want Manchester United. So you know we can move the Liverpool ones out. Um, OK. So this is all about trying to look towards visualization as a way to take back the power, as a way to make data accessible, playable with. Um, but the question has been arising is like, OK, but if you want your visualizations to get more elegant and more complex, how is somebody going to know what to do or how to do? What is visualization literacy? And this is actually not an easy problem to try and reclaim literacy, which we all had to begin with. So if you think about how we became verbally literate, you actually spent 
a long time, 12 years, becoming verbally literate. And what did they do? They made you read all kinds of things. Some of you really liked and some you didn't. They made you discuss them and learn what was great and what was not so great so that you could actually critique them. But most of all, they made you practice writing. And they weren't expecting you to become another Shakespeare, but they were expecting you to write a decent paragraph, write a decent letter, so that you would be literate. And we need a comparison, comparative thing as far as visualization came. If you want to be literate, you need to be able to actually generate. So how can you generate? How can you enable this writing? The, well, we've actually been studying it. This is actually a friend of mine's study. It actually turns out that even if you give somebody an expert, it's still a challenge. It's not an easy thing to do. So the community has thought one of the things, maybe how we can help make people enable writing, is to give them templates. Um, Many Eyes was the first to do this in a public way where you can take your data and put it into an existing visualization template. And this is great. And we have Tableau, Power BI, Excel, all kinds of ways where you could take a bit of data and put it into an existing template, but it's not really actually expressive. It would be like having a paragraph with a few blank words and that you put the words in, you wouldn't feel like you were writing. So it's kind of form fill in viz. Better than nothing, a lot better than nothing. You can alternatively draw it by hand. Great, really expressive, not updatable. You get a new bit of data, you have to start all over again. You can program, and that works great. But is everybody going to go back to school and learn how to program? Probably not. You have jobs, you have things that you do, but maybe you actually want to take back this power of data. So what can we do to enable writing? We've been looking at the concept of constructive visualization and looking at whether we can kind of have a kindergarten viz where if you play with toys, you can actually learn things for yourself. And we have discovered that people, all kinds of just regular people, can build really complex and elegant visualizations by themselves given simple kindergarten toys. And we've taken, it works, it's actually amazing. People are really good at it. This was um, a study where we gave people all kinds of different simple physical objects, physical materials, beads, plasticine, tape, etc. And um, people collected their own data, created their own visualizations of all great variety, super expressive. And for all of the people who did this, they all had a moment of self-reflection, um, self-empowerment, where what they were doing actually really changed and influenced their lives. This is a visualization that was done collaboratively between a mother and daughter about her daughter's, the daughter's eating habits, where they had sort of major realizations of, about how the food affected the daughter's health. Um, this is a visualization of somebody's meditation practice where he was looking at the duration and quality of his meditations. Um, this one is a young woman who was practicing writing, you know, trying focusing on becoming a writer. And so she was looking at her ability to concentrate and um, found that actually her writing benefited if she was just a little easier and gentler on herself, which I think is a fabulous realization. Um, so these people were not trained to do visualization. They were just people who asked to be part of this study. Um, and they were more than capable they, drew, they made, created, really important, relevant visualizations. I actually think that there's no question that data is part of our humanity, that we need to be more active in reclaiming, in bringing the human into the loop in our data society. Um, I love the idea that other people, like Georgia Lupe, is going around giving talks about data humanism. Um, so I think you know, this is the main point of this talk all the way through. Data is very much part of what makes us hum human. It's not something we should give away. We need 
<laughs> to actually interact with it. Um, and it's been with us for time out of mind. And I think that we can work towards increasing data literacy and in that way actually move towards a more informed society. Thank you.